Welcome back to my channel, Immortality. I am the Patriarch John Paul, and this is my teaching ministry. My blessing to you is that you have a happy and prosperous life. Today, this ministry is going to be for Protestants. I'm going to address Protestants, okay? Because you have a lot of uh, questions about the Catholic Church, but you get the incorrect answer because you're asking the wrong people. But before we get into that, let us pray for world peace. Lord, protect our children and give peace to the world. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, for thine, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, give God a kiss. Okay, so let's get started here. Um, let me give you an example. If you want to have your transmission fixed in your car, you don't go to your barber. He only knows how to cut hair. He doesn't know anything about transmission. If you want to learn something about the Catholic Church, you go to a Catholic priest and ask him. You don't ask your Protestant pastor. He doesn't know anything about Catholic Church. All he knows is what he hears from other Catholic, I mean from other Protestant ministers. Third party rumors, that's all. So be smart and learn Catholic from Catholics and Protestants from Protestants. Simple as that. Now, let me give you an, a little bit of history here about the early church. Jesus Christ picks 12 apostles. He gets crucified, but on the third day he rose from the dead, having victory over death. And then he lives on earth for a number of days, and then he ascends into heaven. And the apostles are left with the authority and power of the Holy Spirit to continue the church. What kind of church was it? If you say Christian, you're wrong. It was a Jewish church. When it first started out with the apostles, it was a Jewish church because only members there was, it was Jews. It wasn't until uh, the apostles opened up a second church in the city of Antioch. And in Antioch, the Roman soldiers coined the phrase Christians, or those who follow Christ, Christians. And that could have been mm, maybe 30, 40 years later, after Christ ascended. But meanwhile, it was a Jewish church. And then, uh, in, uh, in the uh, book of Acts, you see that in, uh, in the city of uh, Antioch, the word Christian came out, and we became a Christian church. Then, a while, long go, a while longer goes by, then comes St. Ignatius. He's a bishop of Antioch, okay? And he was arrested by the Roman soldiers and taken to Rome to be martyred for his faith. He was fed to the lions. Can you imagine yourself in the arena there, and there's these lions ready to eat you, kill you and eat you? It's a horrifying uh, thing. But on his way to Rome, which was overland, through Turkey, uh, and then Greece, and then Rome, uh, he wrote seven letters, some to his friends, some to churches, some to villages. He wrote a letter to uh, the people of Smyrna in 110 AD. That's the date, 110 AD. And in that letter, chapter 8, first paragraph, and you can read it on the internet yourself, and I have the the, uh, the website address uh, um, in a link um, in the description below. He writes, wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. So 110 AD, it became the Catholic Church. What is the word Catholic? Catholic means universal. It's a Greek word. It means universal. Why? Because it was being spread from Jerusalem to Alexandria, 
to Antioch, to Damascus, and then to Galatians, Philippines, and so forth, to Greece, Athens, Corinth, Corinth, Thessalonica, and Rome, and so forth. It was becoming everywhere, spread, universal. So it became the Catholic Church. Now understand something really important now. In 110 AD, there was no such thing as Roman Catholic Church. It didn't exist yet. No Eastern Orthodox Church existed, and no Reformed Protestant Churches existed. There was only one church, that was the Catholic Church, it was the Apostolic Catholic Church. Okay? Just so that we understand it now. So, how did, how did the good news of Jesus Christ, his teachings and everything spread? It was through oral tradition. Only thing that they might have had uh, around 40 AD is Paul's epistle, which was the first thing that was written. Uh, Paul writes in one of his uh, passages, I think in the Galatians, uh, he said, uh, Steadfast and keep in your heart those things that we have taught you in word and uh, in letters, which means oral tradition and through uh, the scripture letters. Okay, the Bible was not written yet, so it was oral tradition, or holy tradition, or we call it sometimes apostolic tradition, that we practice the faith. We met every Sunday for service. We practice the Holy Eucharist. We practice making the sign of the cross. We did a lot of different things that became tradition. And those traditions, even though they were in full practice, was never written in the scriptures. Like the, the Holy Eucharist. And the real presence of Christ in the wine and the, and, uh, the bread. It's written by uh, uh, St. Ignatius. It's written by, the, it's in the Didache, or the Book of the Twelve Apostles. Uh, Justin the Martyr. Uh, the, the early church fathers of the first 300 re years have written about the Holy Eucharist. So it existed and was practiced. And there was no Roman Catholic Church then. So, I get a little annoyed of the ignorance of many Protestant people that says, you always talk about the Holy Eucharist. But it's not mentioned in the Bible. And the reason why it's not mentioned in the Bible is because the Bible wasn't written yet. Does that make sense to you? The Bible was put by put together by the Catholic Church, not Roman Catholic Church, Apostolic Church. 318 bishops came together. They were going through all the different books. They had to do it because there were false books spreading around and they had to get the truth right. And while, how, how did they pick which book to choose to put into the New Testament? Those books that conform to the oral tradi tradition. If it was spreading the same news that was being spread by oral tradition, it was in the Bible. So the church came first and put the Bible together and declared it the inspired word of God. Okay? So when you have the Bible and you have holy apostolic tradition, the two witnesses that you might see mentioned in Revelation or Daniel's, the two witnesses for Christ and for God, working together to preserve and operate and run the church. You can't have one or the other. You can't just live on the teaching of the Holy Bible alone because there's so much not mentioned in the Bible that the church has to make a decision on. That's only common sense. Okay? So, uh, let's see. And the reason why um, the Bible, the Catholic Bible, has more books than the uh, Protestant Bible is, the Catholic Bible has 27 books of the New Testament. So does the Protestant. But they have extra books in the Old Testament. Well, the thing was, the Old Testament it was taken from the manuscript called the Septuagint, which was translated from Greek, I mean from Hebrew to Greek, by 70 
rabbis under uh, Ptolemy, the general of Alexander the Great. He was in charge of Egypt and he had it translated. And the Catholics used that translation. The um, Protestants used the Mosaic translation, which is kept in uh, St. Petersburg in Russia, in the museum. Now, that Mosaic uh, transcript, Hasferim, is only 900 years old. The Septuagint is over a thousand years old. So, it was thought to be more reliable, but the Protestants didn't want to follow the footsteps of the Catholics, so they wanted to go just with the original tongue, Hebrew. And, uh, However, when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, those seven extra books that are in the Catholic Bible are in Hebrew on the, ten, on the, ten, uh, on the Dead Sea Scrolls. For years and centuries, uh, Protestants blamed the Catholics because the Catholic Bible had 155 chapters in Psalms. The Protestants only had 150. They used to blame the Catholics for adding those extra five chapters on there. When the Dead Sea Scrolls was found, the entire book of Psalms was discovered, written in Hebrew, having 155 chapters, just like the Catholics. So these are things that you Protestants have to think about. Uh, the sign of the cross. You know, Protestants don't make the sign of the cross. Uh, Catholics do. So does the Orthodox, Episcopal, you know, the Anglicans. They do. The purpose of the sign of the cross is to seal yourself to God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, give God a kiss. Because these three fingers are the Holy Trinity, and these two fingers are are the divinity and humanity of Christ. It's two, two natures. But after you make the sign of Christ, I always give God a kiss. It has meaning. We tie ourselves to the prayers. After prayer service, after study service, after Holy Communion, we make the sign of the cross and we seal ourselves to God. Just like when you walk into a Protestant church, there's, there's nothing here. You walk into an Orthodox or a Catholic church, there is holy water. And you put your fingers into the holy water, and you bless yourself. Now, are you going to tell me that uh, you live a, such a happy life that you, you don't need to have, uh, bless yourself? Everybody needs to bless themselves. We live in a terrible world. We need all the help we get. So Catholics bless themselves with holy water before they enter the church for worship service. That's a big difference there. Now, in the Old Testament, God gave Moses and Aaron instructions on how to build the Holy Temple, his temple, where he's going to reside. And King Solomon's temple was built after the same fashion. They had two rooms, the Holy Place and the Holy of Holies. In the Holy of Holies, there was an altar of stone built and on top of that was the Ark of the Covenant. And then God would come down in the form of a smoke, and between the, ho the two angels whose wings are facing each other, between there, that smoke stopped and rested. So God's Spirit may dwell with His people, Israel. And then the holy place, uh, the holy place is where the priest does his, his function. Now, the apostles, being Jewish, uh, decided to set up the church the same way because it was God's, the Father's instructions. Jesus never went against God the Father. Jesus in Matthew writes, I have not come to, uh, you know, change the, uh, the law or the prophets. You know, no word shall be changed, not even a single dot. So, the Catholics and the Orthodox decided to have the church the same way that King Solomon had his church. The church that Jesus Christ would go into. But then the Protestants would say, yeah, but at, at Jesus' death on the cross, 
the angel tore the veil down. The church doesn't exist anymore. No, no, that's a bad interpretation. What that means is the animal sacrifice is no longer needed to forgive sin because the Lamb of God is hanging on that cross right now. He paid the price for all humanity. That's what that meant. So, <clears throat> when you walk into an Orthodox or a Catholic church, this is the holy place. <clears throat> and you will experience worshiping God with all five of your senses. First, the touch of the holy water to bless yourself. You walk in, what do you do? With your eyes, you see icon pictures telling you stories of the New Testament, John the Baptist, the Nativity scene, so forth. During the church services, you smell with your nose the incense that uh, uh, the priest is incensing the altar. Why? Because Aaron incenses the altar. And if you read in uh, uh, Re Revelation, God in heaven. See, our church, the holy and most holy, is fashioned after the temple in heaven. The temple in heaven exists, and Christ is the high priest there. And they have incense burning all the time to bring prayers to God. So that's why we as Catholics and Orthodox do incense. Protestants don't. When you walk into a Protestant church, it's just plain and empty. It looks like a union hall. You're going to have a meeting. And I'm sorry to say that. Because I love my brothers and sisters of the Protestant faith. But they're being directed the wrong way. I'm just sorry about that. When you partake of the Holy Eucharist, you taste the wine and the way of bread. The body and blood of Christ, you eat it. And it says in the Bible, you cannot have salvation if you don't eat the flesh and drink the blood of Jesus Christ. Well, you can't do it literally, barbarically, so it has to have another meaning. Well, sure, his spiritual essence is there, the essence of the Creator. Just think, to be able to take part of the Creator himself, so he can come in and live inside your heart. Isn't that a wonderful, beautiful thing? The promise is shove the whole away, like it's nothing important. It's just a shameful thing that they do like that. So. Uh, another problem with uh, is confession. They always have problems with confessions. Why do you have to go to confess uh, to a priest? Why can't you just confess to God? Well, yes, you can confess directly to God, but after you get after you get finished confessing your sins, that's it. You don't hear anything anymore. You don't hear you don't hear God say you are forgiven. It's quiet and silent. And you have to believe in faith that you are forgiven. Now, when a Catholic goes to a priest to uh, confess his sins, he's not only confessing his sins to the priest, but Jesus Christ is standing right there next to the priest hearing your confession. Ah, no. Now that can't be true. Yes, it is. Because Jesus Christ in the Holy Scripture says, Where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So he's hearing the confession. So all Catholics are confessing to Jesus Christ himself when they go and tell the sins to the priest. And then, when the priest says, I absolve you of all your sins, you are forgiven. That is Jesus Christ saying that, going through the uh, priest's vocal cords, using his vocal cords to say, you are forgiven. No. Nah. That's hard to believe. Well, how, why is that? If Satan could go through uh, your voice like he did uh, uh, to Jesus when he questioned them, why can't the God do the same thing? No. See, Protestants get it so wrong, they're being taught wrong. Did you know that uh, Martha Luther, John Calvin, John Knox, one of the three great uh, reformers, they were all Catholic priests? But you see, they were priests, not bishops. Only the power of the Holy Spirit flows through the bishop. And when they left the Catholic Church, they severed their ties with their bishop. Which means then they have no power to forgive sin anymore. You see? So they had to come up with some other stuff. You know? Tell your sins directly to God. 
who live by the Holy Scriptures alone, tradition don't mean anything. And all that other stuff, because they had no apostolic succession. See, I could trace my lineage from the bishop who consecrated me, to the bishop who consecrated him, to him, and to him. I am the 256th bishop of St. Peter through the Roman Catholic Church. I am also, I was consecrated twice, I am also the 135th bishop of St. Peter going through the Orthodox Church in Antioch. I can trace my family tree all the way through, unbroken, the power of the Holy Spirit going through that lineage and coming to me and I have the authority to do the Holy Sac seven Holy Sacraments. So I had a child one time. It was time for him to do Holy Communion, and he couldn't because he couldn't uh, believe that Jesus Christ was in the bread and wine. So I said, uh, "Listen, you see, I knew his background. His mother, father are college professors, and they're physics, they're scientists, and they taught their little boy to be like that too. But they left out the spiritual aspect. And I said, if I take a bread and wine." and put it next to a nuclear reactor for a week and then give it to you. Would you eat it and drink it? And he said, no. See, at the beginning, when the boy, uh, when I questioned the boy, the boy told me, when I take the bread that the priest consecrated and the wine, and I look at it underneath a microscope, it looks and smells like bread and wine. The molecules look like bread and wine. So when I gave it back to him, and said, would you eat this after it was sitting next to a, a nuclear re reactor for a week? He said, no. I said, why? It's full of radiation. I said, how do you know? It looks and tastes like bread. You look at it under a microscope, it has the molecules of wine and bread. I don't see no radiation. And that's when two and two click together. Christ is invisible, but he is there. Don't we say that in the Nicene Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And of all things visible and invisible, Jesus Christ invisible in the bread and wine, but he's there. And he becomes part of us when we partake of it. So the boy did have his Holy Communion for the first time. Now, one important thing, when Jesus Christ was approached by Nicodemus on a cool evening as the sun set on the rooftop, Chapter Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 5. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So, the Catholics and the Orthodox and the Anglicans and the Episcopal take this literally. So, when you are baptized, that is being reborn of the water and it washes away, washes away all sin, even original sin by Adam and Eve. That's sacrament number one, but then there's a second sacrament. Sacrament of either confirmation, a Roman Catholic, or chrismation, Orthodox. It's the same thing, just two different names. And what that is, is giving the Holy Spirit to the baby or to the adult who's being baptized. That's the second sacrament. Once that has happened, then you are reborn of the Spirit. So now you have the water of the Spirit. You, are, you have it all complete, and you have salvation. Protestants teach it that it's a, it's a feeling. You know, I wake up one morning, and I just love Jesus Christ, and I accept Him as my Lord and Savior, and, uh, and I feel I am now reborn. It doesn't happen that way. Reborn is being born physically of the washing of the water and physically of the anointing of the holy oil and giving you the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus was talking about. How do I know what's in the story of Acts? Let me read it to you. Okay. Baptism and true understanding of the born, of, uh, born again. Now this is chapter John, chapter 3, 5. When the apostles of... Uh, no... Jesus, uh, chapter 3, verse 5, is, you know, being born of the Spirit and the water into the kingdom of heaven. Now, we come to, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard 
that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there, that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on them. Let me see, the Holy Spirit has not yet con come on any of them, and had simply been baptized. See, they've only been baptized. They haven't received the Spirit yet. Then, uh, Peter and John placed their hands on them and gave them the Holy Spirit. This is found in Acts chapter 8, verse 15 and 17. Verse 15 to 17. You see, two different sacraments to be born again of the water and of the Spirit. That's how it's really done. I hope this video answers some of your questions. Now, there's something else that a lot of Protestants don't uh, real, uh, you know. First of all, the, the Bible that they study from was put together by the Catholic Church. Apostolic Catholic Church. Okay? The church calendars for Advent, Lent, Easter, Pentecost is a Catholic calendar that all the Protestant churches follow. When you see uh, certain times of the year when the, uh, at the pulpit or at the altar table in your church you'll see a green um, a mantle hanging over the, the pulpit or a red or a purple that's the Catholic liturgy of the, of the year purple for Lent and Advent green for ordinary times or red for uh, Pentecostal and when you see that mantle over the pulpit where the priest where your minister talks they're following the Catholic calendar again, the logistical calendar. See? So these are things that the Catholics just uh, love and do and are very happy. That's why we have over a billion, two hundred million uh, Protestant churches all combined together uh, only have like uh, four or five hundred million and then they have two thousand, over two thousand denominations I got into a, an argument with a person on Yahoo about reading the Bible I, and how uh, the Catholic Church forbade it. Well, yeah, they did. It was done in 1034 uh, AD in England. It was done in England where the uh, magistrate and the archbishop forbid the, the public from reading the Holy Scriptures. They were not trained. They were not educated on how to interpret the scriptures properly. So to get allow them to just read the scriptures would cause a lot of problems. Well in time it happened and the printing press came about and everybody got a Bible and everybody's reading it and everybody's interpreting it in their way and that's why we have two thousand denominations of the Protestant faith. So everybody is uh, acknowledging uh, I you know my translation is better. I have the true interpretation. I have the true church. Come to my church, you know. And uh, I have to laugh. But remember that the only thing that is required of salvation is first that you learn and understand about Jesus Christ, that you are baptized and then chrismated, and then you live the holy life afterwards. James says, uh, "Works, faith uh, without works is dead. And right away the Protestant twists that around. And all James is writing and saying is that if you really have the faith, you will go out and do good deeds. You see, faith and works, you know, f works don't, don't save you. Faith does. But if you have a true faith in God, if you really believe, you'll go out and do two things. You're not going to go out and hang around in a bar. You're not going to go and pay a prostitute. You're not going to go and rob a bank. No. You're going to do good things because you have the faith. You see, But a person who comes in and uh, says, I uh, I have the faith, I'm saved, and then goes out and cheats his uh, partner in business. <laughs> what kind of uh, faith is that? That's not good deeds. That's not good works. They cheat your partner. See? So that's what that means. Now, uh, another thing that the Protestants accuse Catholics of 
is um, uh, let's see, I had it at the tip of my tongue. You know, when you reach uh, my age, uh, you start getting old, and uh, it's hard to remember sometimes things. But uh, I wanted to tell you something else, one other thing. Um, I guess I, I can't do that, it skipped my mind. But anyway, I want to give you uh, my final blessing, uh, my final prayer. As we part and go our way, may you forever be with us, O Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And I want to give you my apostolic blessing. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your heart and mind pure and humble in love of the Holy Trinity. And may the God Almighty bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I'll see you next time. Hey, if you like our discussion here, go ahead and tell a friend. Share it. This ministry is open to everybody. God bless you.